So you may have noticed that this is the same text as last week. Uh, last week we did Genesis 2, 18 to 25. We're going to we're going to cover the same text, and that's simply because uh, last week we uh, dealt with the issue of God uh, creating humanity uh, with two specific genders, male and female, uh, but also within this text is uh, the clear intention of God that those males and females would, would come together in marriage. And so before we move on, we need to, we need to see uh, what is it that God is saying about, uh, about humanity as a whole, about society, and about marriage itself. What can we glean from this, uh, this origin story of, of human beings and, uh, and what it means that God, from the very beginning, uh, decreed that there would be husbands and wives? So it's going to be about marriage. Uh, a couple of words before we uh, get to it. Uh, the first is that while this is going to be uh, about marriage and is going to talk a lot about the, the value of it and God's design for it, um, my intention is not at all to either embarrass or to bring any shame to those who've been touched by divorce. Uh, we know that that is a reality in this uh, fallen world. We know that there are a lot of reasons uh, why uh, you might be in that situation or your family might be in that situation. And I just hope that we as a church are the kind of place that would have abundant grace, uh, abundant understanding and compassion um, I was speaking with a, uh, a single mom this week. We were just talking about things, and she was just sharing that that her culture is one that uh, that being a single mom, she feels constantly uh, looked down upon. That, that was her experience um, for many years, and um, and that she she so appreciated just coming and being part of our church because uh, she said she didn't she didn't feel that way. Uh, that people just wanted to relate to her. Uh, and to know her. And, and so I think that speaks well of, of us, of what God is doing in us. And uh, I just, I hope that continues to be the case, uh, that, that while we are going to lift up marriage and talk a lot uh, about it, it's, it's, uh, it's our heart's desire to love everyone and to see God's hand in all of our lives. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, um, for those who are not married, uh, again, my intention is not to give the impression uh, that you cannot be a whole human being unless you are married. Um, it's, uh, it's maybe a confusion that some might have, and sometimes the church has, uh, because we look to Genesis, and that, that clearly the first man and woman were married, and so we sometimes have the impression that every single person, well, you know, when they fully experience what God is going to do in their life, they were gonna, they're going to be married, and it's great because I have, you know, this cousin or the son-in-law that you should probably meet, and we can be the irritating kind of people that are always badgering those who are not yet married. When are you going to get married? When are you going to have kids? And uh, can we just um, be clear about what the Bible says, actually, in the fullness of it? Uh, Paul makes really clear that it's actually beneficial in many ways uh, to not be married and to be able to devote ourselves to what God has called us to. And uh, in case we need a little more convincing, uh, let's remember Jesus the perfect human being uh, was not married, and he seemed to do just fine. So uh, let's just chill out, and uh, you know, you'll know when they've met someone. They'll probably tell you. You don't have to keep messaging them. Uh, so those two things uh, before we get into it. Uh, but yes, we will speak about marriage, and we will speak in a way uh, where we see God's God's wisdom for it and His beauty in it. So let's. I'll start by reading the text again, beginning in verse 18 of chapter 2. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field, but for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs, closed up its place with flesh, and the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Uh, so I have one main point for this morning, 
uh, because I think there is one main point uh, that God is making here in this text uh, about marriage, and uh, so this is it. Uh, God designed marriage for our good. I think it's really clear. I think it jumps off the page, uh, especially when you take uh, verse 18, which we looked at a few times now. Uh, the Lord God said, it's not good that the man should be alone. And then you put that together with uh, in Genesis 131, which is kind of a summary of the whole thing. And God says, now that I've created uh, human beings, male and female, and now that they are one flesh, he says, it's very good. And so the clear implication is that what is very good uh, for creation and for humanity is that there wouldn't just be male and female, but that there would be husbands and wives, and that they would come together, and that they would be uh, united together, committed to each other, uh, connected in every sense of the word, uh, physically, emotionally, spiritually. And so this is the, the clear um, teaching about marriage from the very beginning, uh, that God designed it, okay, I'm going to say that because he did it in a certain way, and that it was good for them and good for us. Uh, those two things together, I think, is, is what we find here in, in Genesis. Now, in terms of the design, uh, there's going to be four things that we're going to look at, four kind of key characteristics of, of marriage according to God's point of view, and that he, he did it a certain way. Um, that part... Uh, to be frank, I, I had, like on Monday, uh, I don't think it's complicated to find the sort of main things that we find in the Bible about marriage, right? Male and female, for life, are there certain roles in it, uh, were to be genuinely united, that, that, that was there. Monday, I had that, working on it. But the goodness part of it uh, was not something that I knew quite how to emphasize uh, until just in the last day or two, as I was prepping, as I was praying. And I think really that is the heart of God's word to us uh, this morning. That he did design marriage in a particular way, but that he did it uh, for our good because he loves us. To, to, to reveal, to use it as a, a mechanism, a way to reveal fully the depth of his love and his grace into our lives. And I say it that way with that kind of emphasis because I think if we don't get that second part, uh, then marriage itself, even if we're clear on like the way it should be done according to the Bible, uh, it, it will most likely at some point end up feeling like a burden or feeling like a, a trial or something that we just have to, to get through. Because if we're honest, uh, we know if we are married that um, there are times when we don't feel like this thing called marriage, is, is that good. And there are definitely times when we struggle with a sense of understanding God's purpose and his love and his wisdom for us in, in this thing that maybe for many months or years has, has felt painful, has felt uh, hurtful, has been deeply unsatisfying. And so I think really the... Uh, the challenge when it comes to understanding Christian marriage, the way that God has revealed it to be, uh, is that since Genesis 3, uh, we have these two competing um, understandings of marriage. The one is that God says, we just read it, look, this is good. This is good that they're together. This is going to be for their blessing and their joy, and, and yet the living of it is, is not that always. And so in those times of, of struggle, where there's this tension. Why is it, Lord, that I, that I don't feel good? How could it be that this thing that you made from the very beginning for the good of humanity actually, as I look around, doesn't, doesn't seem to be good for lots of people? Like, why is it that I get phone calls and emails on a regular basis from people who are convinced that verse 18 is dead wrong? that it actually would be good if I could be alone again. That, that the only hope that I have is just to be free from this relationship. How, how is it that, that we come to this place when, when the lived experience of marriage seems to be in direct contrast to what we, what we find here in, in Genesis? 
And if we know our Bible, then, then we know the answer to this in part. We know that, uh, well, not in part, the main answer is, is Genesis 3, is sin. Uh, the main answer is, is that, yes, in Genesis 1 and 2, uh, the goodness of marriage would have been abundantly clear. I mean, if you can stop for a moment and just to try to imagine what it would be like, number one, to not be plagued by sin, which means to not be filled with a sense of self-doubt and, and a sense of uh, short temper and impatience and self-involvement and pettiness and, and to be both irritating and irritable at the same time. If to not have any of that, just think for a moment. Imagine getting up in the morning and there's this other person who you're, you're, you're one with, and you, you know them perfectly, and they know you perfectly, not exhaustively yet, but there's a genuine desire to truly be united, and, and there's never any communication breakdown, and they never say anything that you take the wrong way, and you never say anything, they're just always one, and it's warm, and you're naked, and I mean, it seems like it'd be really good. There would be a, you can see the delight, you can see, yeah, of course, Lord, that it's not good for Adam to be alone. It's very good for all that you have for them, to be able to fulfill the mandate, to go out into the world, to fill the earth with children bearing the image of God and for each and every human being to glorify God fully and to do it together. Man, that'd be so wonderful. But of course, that's not what we find in Genesis 3. In Genesis 3, what we, what we find is that as soon as, as sin enters the picture. And by that I mean as soon as our relationship with the Lord is fractured, the other relationships in our lives are fractured. And so instead of being united and being for each other, we right away we see that husband and wife are at odds with each other. So let me just read this. This is uh, Genesis 3. This is after they've eaten the fruit. They've hidden themselves. God is coming to look for them. And, uh, and look at how this goes. Verse 9. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. And it just goes downhill from there. Isn't it interesting that however, I don't know how long, but just before, that they were, they were one. They were for each other. They were completely united. It was very good. And then here, as soon as, as, soon as sin enters the picture, Adam, very quickly, he blames. Very quickly, there's all of a sudden, there's a, there's a separation. Imagine from Eve's point of view. Wait, you're, you're pointing to me? Well, where were you? Where were you when the serpent had come. Where were you when I was, I was struggling with this question? You were standing right there. You didn't say anything. All of a sudden, there's, there's conflict, there's tension, and we see in the curse, it's only going to get worse and worse. This is, this is the origin of the problem. And, and sin impacted everything, is what we, what we see in Genesis 3. Uh, creation in general, uh, our physical bodies, our, our relationships, our sexuality, everything. Because once we are disconnected from the God of life, our life becomes twisted and distorted. And so sin is the problem. It's been the problem for like, since then, thousands, thousands of years. It's been the problem. If, if you're a Christian, you know it's the problem. But the, the challenge, I think, is that we forget actually that it's sin that is the problem. We, we have the impression that it's marriage that is the problem or that it's our spouse that is the problem. And our conflict and our struggle tends to be around those things. We tend to spend a lot of time thinking about how we could just fix them or if we could just get them to see all the things we can see so clearly about how they're not doing what they should do and we're not, they're not loving us the way they used to and all, all of these things, our focus is on that or our focus is on marriage itself. If we get so desperate... So hopeless, we come to the point of thinking, God, how could, this, how could you actually intend for me to stay in this for life? We begin to question. We begin to lose hope. 
And so here's God's word to you this morning. It's the word we find here in Genesis. That, that he designed marriage not just for the general good of humanity. He designed your marriage for your good to accomplish his purposes in your life. Amen. That, that, that is his word because that is what's here in the word. That he, he wasn't just thinking in general, I think this will somehow work out. What he, what, he's, what he knew was that through this specific design of marriage and through the work of my spirit, I actually will accomplish this far more in you than if you were to leave. And so there, there are two things I think that are absolutely necessary if you are act, actually able to grasp and to live out God's good design for marriage. The first is, of course, the gospel of Jesus. The gospel is essential. Why? Because if sin is the main problem, the only answer to sin is, of course, who? Jesus Christ, the one who came, the one who left the glories of heaven to come down, to die, and then to rise again. Why? So that we might be free from sin. So that we as individuals might be people who are no longer in bondage to sin, in bondage to death. So that we might actually experience power over those temptations that have plagued us freedom, love, that we might be redeemed, that we might actually be a people who are no longer filled with pettiness and selfish desires, but actually that we would glorify God and seek to live that out. Those are individuals who when you're trying to interact with another individual, man, then there's something God can do. He can work with that. And that's why marriage is not essential to being complete as a human being. Jesus is essential. In him we find wholeness. In him we find peace and love. But if we happen to be married... Well, now we have an opportunity to show that love to someone who we have an intimate connection with. So we need the gospel. We need the hope of Christ. And what's interesting is if we look to the New Testament, we find uh, an added dimension of marriage that you wouldn't see initially here in Genesis, but that God always intended. So look at what Paul says about marriage and look at how he uses the quote from Genesis. This is Ephesians 5, 31 and 32. Paul's speaking about uh, marriage, husbands and wives. He says, first he quotes Genesis, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That's what we just read. But then he adds this, this mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ in the church. Isn't that amazing? He didn't say like, and now since Jesus has come, we've realized that also it, you know, we can read it this way. He's saying, this is what it means. This is what it has always meant, even before Jesus came, that when, when God instituted it in Genesis, he knew that there would be a day when there's a husband and wife who are at odds with each other because of sin that he knew would come, but there's a savior. And that savior redeemed them, laid down his life. And now there's a pattern of forgiveness and reconciliation through Christ. And the whole point was that there'd be Christian marriages that people would look to and say, I don't understand how you can forgive your husband or how you can forgive your wife. And they would say, let me tell you about Jesus because that's what this is about. And so the gospel is is both the image, like if we're to bear the image of of God, we can do it in, in in a fuller way in a sense if we're married by pointing to Jesus, but it's also the power in our marriage. So we need to know Christ. We need to experience his love. But the second thing we need is is we need to trust God's design for marriage. And I say that because it's sometimes possible for us to feel as if we are right with the Lord and yet still be struggling with our marriage and with what the parameters God has set. Most of us know what the Bible says about marriage. But many of us don't actually believe that, it, that it's good for us today. And so when we come to Genesis and we ask the question, God, what, what was your intention? And we see the goodness. We need to realize that that goodness continues to be the case, specifically for us. He, he didn't make your marriage to be a trial, to be a burden, to be something that you just have to suffer through. He made it so that you would experience his love and that you would know him more deeply. And the only way that's going to happen is if we, we actually adhere and submit ourselves to the way that he has crafted marriage. So there are four things that I'd like to look at 
Uh, I only made it through two in the first uh, service. <laughs> so we might only make it through two. But if that's okay, we'll pick it up next week. But, but four things. Uh, and the first one is this. What we see in Genesis in terms of what marriage is to be is that it is to be between one man and one woman. Uh, I think this is crystal clear. Uh, we see it there in the maleness and the femaleness. Uh, we see it also affirmed in, in the New Testament. We see it affirmed in the seventh commandment. You shall not commit adultery, making very clear you are to have one wife or one husband, not others, not other sexual partners. Uh, we see it very clear in terms of God's design for human sexuality, that heterosexual monogamous marriage, this is the, the normative pattern for how human beings should interact with each other. And so if we ask the question, this side of the fall, where human beings are plagued with all manner of different uh, sexual orientations, uh, different inclinations, different temptations, we need, we need to ask the question, how, how is this actually good and loving? I mean, we, we can see on a practical level why God would do it this way. He, he wants the earth to be filled with children, and so it would make sense that it's good that he would create a man and a woman who together and create children. It's good to fill the, the earth. That, that seems good. We get that. We can also uh, see just the, like the evidence. You might say the anecdotal evidence or even now the sociological uh, evidence that uh, children who are raised in a home with uh, a mom and a dad, that they are the most stable and fruitful individuals. There's lots of just like studies that are done to kind of show what human history tends to bear out, that this, this tends to be the most uh, beneficial way for families to orientate themselves. And if you're straight, you, you can see the goodness of it because you, you, you want to be married to someone of the opposite sex. That's, that's the way you feel. That's the desire you have. They seem interesting and attractive, and you're hoping one day to marry one. That, that, so all of that seems um, consistent with, with lived experience for human beings, uh, unless, of course, you aren't attractive to someone of the opposite sex. Uh, if you find yourself as someone who, who has same-sex attraction, then the goodness of this parameter of marriage is, is much more difficult to reconcile with a loving God. Like, how is it loving for me, someone might say, who, when I've been attracted to the same sex all my life, and, and, I, and I want to experience that kind of connection, and yet now you're, you're saying that I can't, and that it's wrong, and, th and that I shouldn't. In that context, this, this parameter of marriage can tend to feel oppressive or restrictive or unloving, certainly. And if you're not a Christian, well, it's easier simply to do away with the whole thing, perhaps, or to co-opt marriage and just say, well, we're, uh, we're going to do it differently. That love reigns, and I love this person, they love me, and so we're just going to go and do that. But if you are a Christian, if you're a Christian, it's not that easy. Because if you're a Christian, you, you love God and you love his word. And so you, you, you feel the right conviction of the spirit of God that you want to live a life that is patterned after this, this word of God. You believe that it's life-giving and yet there's a, there's a struggle within you because everything in you feels like it's not fully life-giving. Because it seems that, that somehow, some way, you're, your inclinations... Your, your affections, your desires are, are at odds with this. And so, and so what do we say? What does the Bible say to those in that situation? Well, I believe God's word to you this morning is, is this. That in this design of marriage between one man and one woman, and this pattern of sexuality, God is not meaning to withhold anything from you. He's not trying to keep anything from you. He's trying to give you everything. He's, he's trying to give you everything that he has, every blessing, every bit of love, every bit of experience of grace and wonder and mercy. He's trying to give you the kingdom of God. 
and that you, you cannot get that. Any of us cannot get that if we are at odds with him. And so at stake here is, is not just our human relationships here for this time. What's at stake is our relationship with God himself. And he comes to us in mercy and in grace with a word of compassion. And I want to read to you from the New Testament where we see this stated quite directly. 1 Corinthians 6, Paul writes this, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Do you see Paul's heart here? He's saying to all of us, all of, all of you were in sin, all of us are in sin. Whether we're thieves, drunkards, greedy, whether there's all manner of sexual morality that is present, to, to the man who's looking at pornography, who, who isn't yet married, is sinning against his future wife, to, to, to the wife who is beginning an emotional affair with a man from work, to, to the one who is attracted to other people and is indulging in that, to those who are simply lying, all, all of us are what's at stake, the kingdom itself. And in God's love, in his mercy, he comes down and he says, look, I'm warning you. I'm warning you out of love. And I'm pointing you in the direction, in love, to say that if any one of us is in sin at at threat, at issue, is the kingdom. The parameters are there because he loves us. And because he wants everything for us. He, he wants for us to, on the day of judgment, step through the threshold into the kingdom of God and to be one with the creator of the universe, to be in the presence of Christ. He knows that in this life there will be trials, there will be disappointments, but the hope that he brings is that we, we have already part of the kingdom. We have already the presence of Christ. And he means that to be the comfort and healing that we need. He means to give us everything. And so for those of us who are in some man manner of sexual sin, whatever that might be, it, it is a word of warning. But it's a word of warning because he loves us because he wants to draw us near. And there is no promise that we will be completely free of these divergent sexual affections. There are some of us who will struggle with lust until the day we die. There are some of us, some of us who will struggle with same-sex attraction until the day we die. That, there is no promise of that. There is a promise that in the kingdom we will be free of all those things, of all temptation to sin, and that we will experience complete wholeness and oneness with our creator. So the first thing we see, God's good design of marriage is that it is between one man and one woman. The second thing is this, that marriage is intended to be for life. Uh, I think this is implied in Genesis, not explicitly stated. I mean, you get the sense that Adam and Eve would, should be together for, you know, till they, I guess till they die. It's not stated there but you'd be surprised if Adam found someone else in a few years, right? It seems like they, this is intended to be one, to be lasting. And in case you weren't totally sh sure, in the New Testament, we have more explicit verses about this. Here's 1 Corinthians 7, 39. A wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. Sorry, a wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives, but if her husband dies, she is free to be married to whom she wishes only in the Lord. Uh, this is, I think pretty much universally accepted. Uh, inside or outside the church, this is usually what's part of our vows. I've never had a married couple, like sometimes there are parts of vows that, you know, they want to talk about, but I've never had anyone say, mm, till death was part, I'm not sure I want to include that. Right? It would be, it would question the depth of their love right away. Everyone kind of knows, right? If, if you want to be married to someone, you're saying it's you and me for life. That, 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 that seems right and good. It expresses a heart of, of romance, a heart of affection, a heart of commitment. These are all the things that, that, we, that we love and approve of. 
Uh, again, whether you're a Christian or not, we would say, yeah, that, that is what marriage is. That's the clear intention. But I think we also know, if you've been married for more than a week, that that, that sense of, uh, of, of connection, that, that sense of overwhelming, of course, uh, through thickness and thin, uh, better or poor, you know, better or worse, richer or poor, sickness and health, like all those things, absolutely, honey, that, there is a sense in which that, that can wane over the years. And it happens for lots of reasons. Uh, it, it partly is the difference between stages of life a lot of the time. It's one thing to be newly married, uh, no children, less responsibility. It's another thing seven years in, ten years in, with two kids, three kids. Now they're demanding your attention and affection. Things at work are not going well. Life is not as easy as you thought. And you begin to to struggle under the pressure. And all of a sudden, you don't seem quite as committed to each other. Or the experience of the the lived relationship is, is not so tight. You don't have date night every night. You don't even have conversations every day. And, and you can get to the point of feeling like this, man, this, uh, this loving, intimate experience of marriage is, is not what I thought it would be. Or worse, you're in a marriage where you've experienced real hurt or, or betrayal. Worse, perhaps you realize that your spouse doesn't seem to be fully committed to you. Maybe it's outright adultery. Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's messages you've seen. Whatever it might be, you you start to realize, wait a second. This isn't at all what I thought it would be. They're not even even in this the way that I I am. And now now what do I do? How is it loving when I turn to my Bible and and see what does God say to me and and what it seems like God is, is saying is, well, you made a commitment for life. You made a covenant. You made a vow. Because that is what the word says. And, and let me add a little caveat here. Uh, that I'm, I'm not here speaking about uh, relationships where abuse is present. Uh, in those kinds of relationships, uh, what the church would say, what I would say to you is, is please come talk to us in that kind of situation. Uh, what we've done in the past is to make sure that, that you're safe, that someone is removed from any kind of abusive situation. That is the right immediate response from, from the church. And uh, we've had to do that. We've done that before. So that, that's not what I'm talking about. But I, I would like to point out that even when it comes to a betrayal in marriage, not, not abuse, but like adultery, even when it comes to, uh, like, the, that's the second worst thing, the most grievous thing, the most heartbreaking thing, I'd like you to see what Jesus says about it and how he says it. Because there are allowances. We we probably all know that. But I want you to look look at his tone. This is Jesus responding to some questions from the Pharisees. There's a long section I'm going to read, Matthew 19. And the Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? And he answered, notice what he answers. He points back to Genesis. Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So their question, uh, can't we get divorced? And Jesus is like, no, no, don't, don't you remember Genesis? One flesh, hold fast. So they are no longer two but one flesh. But therefore God is joined together, let not man separate. They said to him, well, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? And they're like, yeah, but Moses said there's, we could get out of this somehow. And what's Jesus' response? He said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. So he gives an allowance, but notice, notice the, it's an allowance. Jesus is saying, uh, look, that's not the way it was to be from the beginning. From the beginning, it was to be for life, through thick and thin. And notice he's saying this, not, not in Genesis 2. You can sort of understand if God's saying, no, look, 
in Genesis 2, in paradise, hey, hey guys, this is forever. You guys good with that? Great. Fantastic. We love, we love each other. It's fantastic. There's no sin. Yeah, we'd love that. But he's not saying it then. He's saying it thousands of years later when humanity has been struggling with this, when people have been cheating each other, uh, with each other for years. He knows who he's talking to. He's talking to us. And he's saying, yes, yes, there is an allowance, but why is it there? Because of your hardness of heart. What does that mean? It means that, that you're so, at times, focused on the hurt that you're experiencing, you're missing the bigger picture of what God might be doing. And this is the greatest tragedy, I think, of divorce a lot of the time. That there might be something that God wants to do in your life, some area of sin that you can't see, something that's been there deep, and, and it's, it's only when things start to get difficult and it begins to rise to the surface, but the pain is so great that you, that you say, I'm, I'm out of here. And with good reason, hear me, good reason. Jesus says, adultery, someone sinned against you, there, there's, a, there's a breakage there. There's an allowance there, yes, but, but can we also look to see what God might be doing in and through difficult marriages? That if sin is the problem, that means that there is sin in our spouse and sin in us. And that the biggest difference between those two is not the amount. That tends to be what we, what we focus on. We, we, in our minds, it's so clear, the mountain of sin, the mountain of wrong, the mountain of just all the ways they're hurting us, that's the comparison we make, and it's the wrong difference. The biggest difference that should stand out to us between our partner's sin and our sin is the fact that we can actually do something about our sin. That God has laid the conviction upon us that when we see sin, we can come to him. We can repent. We can experience forgiveness. And that even if they remain as they are, that's, that's not the point. The point is, what is God doing in your life? What might he be doing through this inattentive, selfish person? Might he not be revealing certain selfishness in you? Might he not be wanting to use this so that your sins might be exposed, so that you would experience the, the grace and renewal and the hope of the gospel, and then perhaps, as you choose, against everything the world would say to stay in this difficult marriage, that you might, that grace might come to bear on your spouse's sin, that they may be broken as you forgive them of things they've done against you. And you might be able to testify to the power of Christ, when your friends say, why would you stay? And you say, because of what my God did for me. He was faithful to me, even when I was in sin, even when I didn't deserve it. I'm not saying that it's always wrong to leave. What I'm saying is that if we look at what God's pattern is, it's there for a reason. It, it's there not just for the sinless two human beings that experienced it for a week or whatever it was, it's there for all of us. Even now, especially now, that if we are soft-hearted towards who God is and what he wants to do, that we would, we would realize that in staying in a difficult place, in a different relationship, we would experience God's love in a more powerful way than we ever could alone and that it's the wonder and the miracle of Jesus that he does this in us, that he does this through us. So here's my call for us. My call for us as, as a church, whether we are married, whether we hope to be married, maybe we know people who are married, may we have a heart that desires to see God's love fill us with hope, fill us with grace, Fill us with peace so that there could be a beautiful and genuine picture of the gospel in each marriage and so that each people in that marriage would know who they are as children of God, would experience his love in a powerful way and would be able to show it to each other. As I said, there's two more points, but we ran out of time. So we're going to come back next week. 
Uh, I'm going to invite the band to come up. Uh, They're going to begin to lead us in worship. But I would love to pray for us. I'd love to pray that, um, that we would have soft hearts and open ears to what God is saying this morning. And that we would experience the renewal of gospel love. So let me pray. Lord Jesus, the truth is that it's so difficult for us to be in relationship with each other. I mean, even just friendship is hard, Lord. With, with the degree of corruption in our hearts, with the, the, the hardness, with the hurt that we've experienced, and, and the difficulty it is to actually open ourselves up to another human being, and yet, Lord, you've decreed that marriage would be a relationship that is um, two people wholly committed to each other, uh, f- vulnerable, open. And, Lord, that's a beautiful thing, but it can be so hurtful when the person that we are deeply connected with dismisses us or neglects us or hurts us. And so, Jesus, I pray that you would move in our hearts especially, Lord, in the hearts of those who are struggling right now, especially those who are struggling to feel loved and and feel as if marriage itself uh, is hopeless. Holy Spirit, please open our eyes. Open our eyes to see the work that you can and will do as we submit ourselves to your word, as we come to the cross. And Lord, may we seek to be gracious with others as you are with us. So I thank you for your love. I thank you for the goodness of marriage. And may it truly be good in our lives. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.